Hello, welcome to Football 360. We're coming to you from Alfred Skeet Reserve where Armadale are hosting the struggling Western Knights. The results of this all-important clash a little later on the show. Also this week is this, the next rising star from WA, and we bring you a new segment to help you get fit. A team that could be in the Premier League next season has a history that spans four decades. They proved they could match it with the big guns after earning a semi-final berth in the Knight Series. Now, Ashfield are looking for promotion come 2013. Since 1972, when it was first formed, Ashfield has evolved from dynamos to its merger with Bunbury in the 90s. But this year, Ashfield Sports Club is adamant it's destined for the top. We have a five-year plan, which does include promotion to the Premier League. Um, our ambitions include basically playing in the Premier League and sustaining that position. Last year was, I guess, a stepping stone to, to this year, and, and that's what we're after, that elusive uh, from promotion. It may sound like tough talk from a Division 1 team, but this club seems to have a plan. We're installing a bit of professionalism on and off the park, so we, we feel that we're ready to move and uh, ready to be a force in this state. And to do that, it's going back to basics and build from the bottom. Obviously one of our glaring criticisms is we don't have juniors in 2013, that will change. We've got heavily involved in our local community, so with the town of Bassendine, we're certainly looking at developing quite a strong juniors program. After 12 rounds, Ashfield stands in second spot, just one point behind Division 1 leaders Wanneroo City. But with a buyer scheduled this weekend, Ashfield could find itself slipping down to fifth spot after round 13. Matt Carruthers, only in his second year as head coach, is confident he has the players to do the job. The lure is, I guess, the culture of the club, and that's what we've worked hard to do, is make sure that you know it is a club that players want to come here and play for because the club looks after them. And you know that's, that's around the ground, whether it's with jobs and accommodation, and we'll, we'll help our own. And I feel like we showed in the night series that we can, with this team, compete with you know, the Premier League side. So you know, all we've got to do is take this team that we've got build every week and there's no reason why we can't win promotion. Matt Wardle is one of the team's faithful. He joined the club last year after leaving Inglewood and while United have since acquired arguably WA's best league coach in Graham Normanton, Wardle says he was never tempted to abandon ship. All the boys around here, everyone's confident coming to the start of the year, first game of the year, we're so confident knowing that you know we can mix it with the big boys and you know, next year I think we will be there. I like to think we're moving up and uh, I wouldn't be in this job if, uh, if I thought otherwise. Socceroos Reese Williams and Chris Hurd are all from WA and they're also the product of ECU Joondalup. Now the club has another star in waiting, 16-year-old Cameron Burgess, who's just signed a three-year scholarship deal with Fulham. I'm on a two-year uh, youth scholarship, uh, followed by a one-year professional contract, uh, which should see me to the for three years uh, into the reserves. So that's quite a, a significant achievement. You're going to be living, breathing, sleeping football. Yeah, hopefully that's that's a dream. So, so in three years from now, you could be playing for the first time. The aim is to get there as quick as possible. Obviously, just got just got to work hard and. Uh, Try to get there as fast as I can, if possible. What's the training there like? What skills development? How does it compare to what you've learned here? It's uh, it's obviously it's a fast-paced game, uh, and you've got you've got to be on your toes when you get it, and you've got to be like know what you want to do uh, two or three steps ahead of of play. So it must be a great sense of pride knowing that uh, at only 16 you've you're going to be playing uh, football professionally full time for the next three years of your life. Yeah, definitely. My dad's dad's obviously proud of me. He. He played football and also my, my granddad as well, they both played professional football so just got, uh, kind of pretty proud of my families and uh, just want to just carry that on really. If it came to being selected and you've got your residency I'm, 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 and you've got your citizenship you said, yeah, yeah. so are you going to fly the flag for Scotland or Australia in the uh, World Cup campaign? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big decision but uh, I'd, I'd like to try and get there first and then make a decision later on. <laughs> Go, go, go. 
Northwest, happily supporting the communities of WA. Hi, my name is Rohan and I'm here with Katie Gill. Uh, today I'll be demonstrating the 360 degree lunge. 360 degree lunge is a compound exercise using all major muscle groups through your legs. So we're talking about glutes, quadriceps, hamstrings, uh, your adductors. We're doing it in a 360 degree pat to increase your neuromuscular adaptation in all three movement patterns. Now I'll get Katie to demonstrate the exercise to you. So as you can see, Katie's keeping her chest up, back straight, core nice and tense, pushing off her heels, not letting her knees go over her toes, keeping nice form and technique with that rear lunge, not putting any stress on her knees. So doing the same with the other leg. 360 degree lunge, you can progress this exercise by increasing the intensity by using the weight for greater stability and control. Join us next week for some more football tips brought to you by Good Life Health Clubs. Time to check out the match of the week now. Here's Ashley Morrison with all of the highlights. After a tight first half with honours even, three minutes into the second, Floriot won possession at the edge of their penalty area. Boy fed Mark Pritchard, who in turn found Heaney wide on the left. He looked up and played a superb crossfield ball to pick out Mickey Roberts. His shot beat Dunn but struck the crossbar and first to the rebound was Boland to give Floriot the lead. Two minutes later and Floriot had doubled their lead. Perth's midfield disintegrated as Mark Pritchard carried the ball out of his own half and then slid a pass into the path of Boland. On a tight angle, the striker did well, beating Dunn at his near post for his and Floriot's second. In the 63rd minute, Floriot again tore through the Perth midfield. Heaney found Boy, who in turn fed substitute John Brooks, who cut inside killed Kelly with ease and struck a left foot shot that left Dunn grasping air. Yet three minutes later, out of nothing, Perth had a lifeline. A long ball forward from Naglieri found Onoforo wide on the left, who hit his shot on the half volley, catching Effie out of position, and the ball nestled in the back of the net. Buoyed by that goal, Perth went in search of a second. Naglieri released Adam Batchelor down the left, and he found Onoforo. The ball rolled to Charland, who was then caught by Spencer Harris, and Perth had a penalty. Up stepped the normally lethal Onoforo, and despite Effie showing early which way he was going to go, he shot straight at the keeper, and Perth had squandered a great opportunity. The final score, Perth 1, Florida Athena 3. In other results, Inglewood United moved to equal top with Floriot and Bayswater thanks to a 6-0 drubbing of ECU Joondalup. Balcata put five past Bunbury four and force, with Daniel Masewski claiming four. Sorrento were back to winning ways at Sterling Lions, while a brace to Jackson Turner helped the Western Knights to a crucial win over fellow strugglers Armadale. Which means the Western Knights and Armadale have a slight buffer between themselves and Bunbury four and force and Joondal up at the bottom, while Florida, Inglewood and Bayswater all share top spot with Sorrento a point behind them and Perth just a point behind Sorrento. Looking ahead to this week, and the key matchup has to be the Sunday fixture between Bayswater City and Perth, while Floriot, Balcata, Sterling and Inglewood will all be looking to make sure they claim all three points to stay in touch with the leaders, but all face tough encounters against teams struggling to survive. Next season's A-League draw has been unveiled. The 26-week competition will see Perth Glory home for 14 matches. Due to some refurbishments at Nib Stadium, the first game against Brisbane will be held at Patterson Stadium on the 5th of October. Let's have a listen to Glory coach Ian Ferguson. I've had a good look at it and uh, I think it's a lot better than last year. You know, we've got no road trips on there as well. We've got, uh, I think for the first time in our A-League history, we've actually got 14 home games as well. So 
all good, yeah, I'm really pleased with it. I suppose it's only right and fitting that the season should start with a grand final replay. Yeah, look, you know, obviously it's a, you know, it's a, a great game to be involved in. You know, the, obviously the grand final, we lost it. And, uh, you know, to play them so quickly again after that, you know, is, uh, I'm sure there'll be a little bit added spice to that one. What do you uh, think of that game being at Patterson's? Yeah, look, uh, obviously the the stadium, I believe, is not available. That or, or won't be ready um, at that time. So I believe I've got to go to Parsons and, and play that game. Um, any questions regarding uh, venues? You know, I'm not really. I'm sure you'd need to speak to the CEO, CEO on that one. But from what I believe at the moment, uh, it's not available for us. With regards to the on-field stuff, though, do you feel it's a bit of a disadvantage? Like the fans are a bit further away, the players aren't as familiar with the venue. Is any of that a factor? Yeah, look, it's my first time, obviously, going to the stadium as well. I'd, I would prefer, obviously, to go to Nib. You know, it's more of a footballing stadium um, than, than going to the Big Oval. Uh, but look, that's that's the way it's got to work out. That's what we've got to do. We've got to. Uh, play where we can and uh, if the stadium's not available then we, we can't play there. The 14 home games also good news for fans I guess and um, how much of an advantage is it for the side? Yeah look it's, it's good because um, I believe you know that we do a lot of travelling and to get that 14th game uh, whether it be regional whether it be at home at, at Nib or elsewhere you know uh, is a big plus for us um, you know and because uh, we definitely do do a lot of travelling over the over the course of the season and to, to get that one I, I really do feel that's a little bit of an advantage for us which is good. How does this year Squad compared to last year's. Yeah, look, obviously I'm, I'm excited. You know, I think there's a, we've brought a lot of young players in. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of potential. Last year we had a, a really good, strong squad. I do believe, again, in, in my personal opinion, the squad's not as strong as. Um, but what we have brought in here is energy and mobility and potential for, for next season. There's been heartbreak and joy at the 2012 Euro Championships and while some say that's football, the gospel of the game continues to spread throughout regional WA. Football West recently visited Albany to meet the local junior and senior football associations regarding their plans for the future growth of the sport in the Great Southern. Board member Henry Arturo and Chief Executive Peter Hugg visited the port city aimed at bringing the junior and senior bodies and other regional stakeholders closer together to develop the sport's appeal. Further visits and meetings will take place in the upcoming months to progress these discussions. And that wraps up another busy week of Football 360. Thanks for watching. You'll see us again next week. Bye for now.